Okay, so thank you for joining the last session of the day. Uh, my name is Jordan Juris. I'm a research engineer at Soundwide and the research team. Uh, and I formerly am working as a research engineer for Native Instruments. We were acquired by Soundwide recently. And I'm presenting a study of control methods for percussive sound synthesis based on GANs. And I did this research together with Antonio Ramirez, who's a PhD candidate at UPF in Barcelona. And we were working together with Julian Parker and Javier Serra for this work. So let's get some context first. So as everybody here knows, synthesis techniques for sound for uh, percussive sounds has evolved a lot in the last decades. We can pin some starting point at, say, the Roland TR-808 in the 1980s, uh, which was giving people a hardware tool for drum synthesis. Um, and today, we've moved all the way up to VST solutions like Sublab and Kick2, which give people a lot of uh, creative control over the actual synthesis process that drives their um, drum sounds. Uh, recently, uh, deep learning has come into the play, and uh, some novel methodologies for synthesizing data have been uh, proposed and have been put to good use, and related research in drum synth synthesis has also had uh, a lot more attention recently. And unlike the former technology space that was on the last slide, we're looking at a data-driven world where a lot of paradigm has shifted. And uh, this is part of the motivation for this talk, looking at new ways of uh, imparting control on these systems. Um, some recent research, uh, Javier Nastal and Jake Drysdale, who I think is here, um, published DrumGAN and adversarial synthesis of drum sounds. And they both use generative adversarial networks for synthesizing the drum sounds. And each of these uh, papers um, we're proposing different means for controlling the synthesis, uh, temporal feature conditioning and drum class conditioning, respectively. However, neither of these studies evaluated any user preference regarding these respective approaches. And this is something that we were interested in looking at. So, in general, generative adversarial networks expose way too many parameters for anybody to make any intuitive use of. Um, the number scales with the dimensionality of your latent space. And there's even further permutations related to network architecture uh, choices. And as an example, a vanilla style GAN implementation with a latent space of 512 uh, with five modulated network layers can have something like 2,500 parameters. So this is totally ridiculous to expect anyone to use. Um, so in order to make a GAN-based synthesizer usable, one needs to go from something like this, which is an absolutely terrible user experience, to something more like this, which is a bit more familiar with all of us. So you put some knobs on it, and those knobs are perceptually meaningful and also musically intuitive. So the goal of this work is to compare the terrible UX, which is we're going to treat as our baseline, which is navigating the latent space directly with sliders, to two different approaches that were motivated by research that was done in the uh, domain of image synthesis. So the first is interface GAN, which is a supervised classification-based approach. And the second is called SAFA, which was a closed form factorization approach that requires no uh, classification. It's unsupervised. And then we're going to use a, do a user study and use something called the Creative Support Index to evaluate how people can use these different interfaces in order to support their creative wishes while they're producing some drum sounds. And ideally, we come up with a little bit of insight about how artificial intelligence can make music production a little bit more accessible. So in order to do this, we have to have a GAN. And the GAN that we chose to use was a style GAN 2 architecture. And I'm not going to go into any details about this, because it's not the topic of the, of the work, but this was the one that we chose. And I want to just want to focus on one motivation for this choice, which is on the left side of the network, which is the generator. And that is that style GAN comes with one advantage of many. That is that it uh, proposes a slightly more disentangled latent space. And technically, it's this guy here. Um, and it's called, re referred to as a style space. But essentially, what you have is um, a relaxed constraint for the goal of the network. So a typical GAN will 
attempt to map uh, your feature, the feature dimension, uh, or sorry, the feature space of your data down into a uniform multi-dimensional Gaussian, which is this Z space, which is usually referred to as the latent space. But by having a mapping work network um, that separates these two between the Z space and this intermediary latent space, you can, um, if you're lucky, get a more uh, conditioned latent space like this. Uh, this is like an illustration from the original StyleGAN paper, and Keras and the NVIDIA team were, um, this was a very large uh, uh, part of the reason why this uh, implementation had so much success. And what we're looking at here, especially in the context of trying to put knobs on a synthesizer, is having the means to interpolate with some predictability stepwise through this space. So this was a pretty big motivation for that architecture choice. StyleGAN 2 also has some techniques involved in the architecture that gives better training stability, that makes our job easier. And both of the references that we're using for this paper used StyleGAN 2 as case studies in their work. So we thought it was a good idea to go with this choice. So we train the network on the entire corpus of native instruments expansion samples. And these are professionally designed one-shots. They're time-aligned, and this amounts to us having to do less work with pre-preparing um, the sounds for the training scheme. And this is the distribution of the drum classes in the training set. So we have about 20,000 samples in total. Um, and I'm going to quickly show you some sounds that the network, the train network, generated. So we have some. Sorry, that was a hi-hat. This is another hi-hat. Kick and sub samples. There's no sub in here, just so you know. And then some cool miscellaneous samples. There's some snares and claps. And some toms. So. The network can make some sounds. So now we need to focus on controlling it. So as was mentioned, you can use a conditioning signal, which forces the model to learn a conditional probability while training based on some input that you feed it during the training process, which can be something like a drum class, the class of the drum that you are attempting to coerce it into reproducing, or something even more complicated and rich, like the envelope of the drum sound. But the only thing here is that this has to be done during training. And what we want to do is provide a means to actually parameterize something that's already been trained. So that leaves us with the task of trying to work with the latent space. And we want to find directions within the latent space that have some interpretable meaning, which allows somebody to take a latent code, Z, which comes from that uniform Gaussian distribution, push it through the network, which is G here, the generator, and produce a sound. This is representing a sound now. And we want to be able to modify that sound stepwise with some scalar amount of modification in order to produce a new sound. So you're giving someone knobs. And if you're doing this in the style space, the equation is the same. So this is our baseline attempt for parameterization in the uh, latent space. So this is the thing that we were looking at before, the really bad, terrible UX, where you have 512 latent dimensions, and then you put a slider for each of them and expect someone to be able to use that. And now we're going to look at interface GAN. So interface GAN was the supervised approach. And the way that you deduce the, the directions for, from this uh, approach is that you classify data. So we generated 10,000 data points, which are sounds, with the train network. And then we classify it using the seven audio commons extractor features, which gives us a mapping within the style space um, of um, where all those classifications live within the actual latent space. And then using a support vector machine, we discovered boundaries in that space. And as per the interface GAN um, literature, we extract the, dimen or sorry, the directions in the latent space by finding the normal vectors to these boundaries. So then we can step along these direction vectors with a scalar amount of modification um, in the style space. And this is how this interface GAN approach uh, works. And now for the SAFA approach, which is the closed form unsupervised method. So you don't need to do any sampling. 
And rather, you depend on actually having knowledge of the weights of the model itself, the trained model. So um, it's noted in this uh, research that the step um, that you're making um, in the latent space can be expressed also having this being the A being the weight matrix. So this is like the, the, the matrix representing all the coefficients of the network. You can have this uh, modifiable scalar time, times the dot product between the weight matrix and the latent direction that you're looking for. This is the first point. And then it's shown that these latent directions can actually be solved by um, finding a solution to this optimization problem, where you're looking for ranked directions in order of the perceptible um, affect that they impart upon the samples. And it's shown further that the solution to this is actually finding eigenvectors with the largest eigenvalues of the weight matrix transpose multiplied by itself so you have a simple task ahead of you of finding these eigenvectors uh, using only the matrix, or sorry, the, the weights of the network. So this is pretty nifty. Um, so we developed three different GUIs in order to allow somebody to play with this. So the first is uh, just the z-space. So we have here a two-dimensional uh, two pixel grid that you can draw into, or you can generate a random seed. So this is playing with the z-space. And the next one is exposing then uh, sliders that have the audio commons features on them. And then finally, we have the safer directions that are unlabeled and ranked in order of their perceptible, perceptual uh, affect that they impart upon the sample. Um, and then we had 14 participants from Native Instruments with various musical backgrounds. And they each did three surveys, one for each uh, scheme. And so for the results. Um, it was shown that SAFA um, was the favored um, uh, creative uh, support system um, by quite a large margin. And it was interesting for us to see that uh, the interface GAN performed on the same uh, level as the z-space, which and we thought that this was <laughs> not going to be the case. So this may be leading to a little bit of uh, questions about how the user study uh, results ended up manifesting. And you can see, furthermore, that the confidence margins don't make these results statistically relevant. However, I would like to share with you that um, in debriefing sessions with the, with the participants, this tendency for SAFA to be the preferred method were echoed um, pretty much by everybody, just by verbal communication about their experience with the, with the uh, GUIs. Um, and I would want to share a couple of these with you now. So um, it was unanimously seen that the latent directions from the SAFA approach were giving reliable and consistent um, conceptual uh, modification to the, to, the, to the seeds. So the sliders one and two were controlling drum class and noise amount in the output audio. And these are, of course, highly correlated because you add noise to certain uh, periodic symbols and you actually are playing with the drum class. And then sliders three and four were kind of um, relegated to decay time, depth, and boominess, like more fine-tuning. And then five and six didn't really do much. So people were actually using sliders one, two, three, four while they were playing, and they were doing this reliably and having fun with it. On the other hand, interface scan had some problems. They were pretty redundant. There was not a good sense of orthogonality between what the sliders were doing. So it was not a very good user experience. There was lack of uh, control consistency from one seed to the next. So for what one slider was doing was dependent on the seed that was actually uh, present in the system. And there was also some inconsistencies between <laughs> the name of the feature that was listed on the knob, or sorry, the slider, and actually how that was affecting the sample. So interface GAN was just didn't perform very well at all. Um, and I just wanted to also share this cool approach that some of the users were reporting, um, like a recipe for creating drums. So they would um, use the first two sliders in SAFA to tweak and find the right drum class of the snare, for example, that they're looking for. And then subsequently, each random seed that they were pulling from the latent space was a snare. And they were able to pick out the one that they wanted to then finally tune using sliders three and four. And this was all done with no uh, semantics. And this was, for us, maybe one of the most important take-homes, was that 
while Seifa was actually performing best with, it, with respect to consistency and reliability of the modification of the synthesizer, it actually uh, got a lot of people excited that they didn't have anything to work with other than a few arbitrary seeming um, sliders that didn't have um, or didn't force on them any required knowledge of music technology at all. And so it's kind of like a double win. Um, in conclusion, Seifa was the winner. <laughs> and looking into the future, I think that it's worth going back and revisiting the interface scan direction extraction uh, by improving the classification. I think it's quite likely that finding a better scheme for classifying the data um, in a way that would be best suited for this task itself um, is probably going to give that another chance of being considered for this type of uh, param parameterization task. And finally, um, the style GAN architecture in particular um, is designed in order to permit style mixing, which means that a latent vector can be um, independently applied to a specific um, uh, layer in the convolution network, and you can have different, essentially, configurations where you are sending different latent vectors to different um, levels of the, of the network, which gives you even more control. And I think that we could look into how that correlates with these two different approaches. And that's everything. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was cool. Um, questions, please. While, while you're thinking of a question. Oh, there is one. Ah. Oh. Thank you for the great talk, Jordan. Um, I just had one question. Just like naively, um, I wanted to understand if you could compare and contrast like SAFA versus, say, just sampling the W space and then like with some n equals a great number of samples and then doing PCA on the result of that. Is there something different yeah. here that is more elegant From or Saifa, about the same? For, like SAFA specifically, where you're doing like some the closed form of uh, factorization approach? Yeah, yeah. I was just kind of wondering, like, w would it have worked to just sample the W space extensively and then try to pull, pull out like some uh, principal component vectors? Yeah. Um, well, I think that we wanted to um, just treat interface as like the one that was the sampling-based supervised learning approach, and I guess the, uh, the 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 way that that was done using an SVM to find these boundaries and finding the normal vectors, it can be seen as being somewhat similar to like a component analysis, uh, looking just at those features as the um, considerations for that analysis. But um, I can tell you like in a very hand-wavy and unsatisfactory way that the interface scan literature uses this approach that you're describing, and they're just simply showing that it wasn't as effective. So okay. we just that works for me. We did Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm easy. Questions. Next question. Yeah, thank you. That was very cool. Um, so, um, um, regarding um, parameters, no, model parameters, you said you are, were working with 2.5 thousand parameters. Was that? Um, oh, sorry, this was just some sort of example of like a ballpark estimation for how many parameters there can be, but specifically in our network, there was 512, and this was like the naive um, dimensionality of what you can control in the latent space as a, as a parameter. Yeah, so I'm, I'm just wondering, did you try out uh, yeah, nets, uh, networks that were much bigger, so with much more parameters? To, um, and Listen to that and... and uh. Uh, we just used this network. Um, honestly, uh, training these can be tricky, and we were happy to get one that was making cool enough sounds in order to actually do the analysis. But I would expect that uh, with more data, either you get redundancy or you get an enriched representation of the sound um, space, and it could go either way, where you could get more consistent or more... Uh, unpredictable results with this type of uh, parameterization. I think it's something to explore for sure. Third row? Oh, actually, I've, I've got you. 
Um, I don't know if I missed that, but did you give these eigenvectors some names, or did you find them in any meaningful way, like brightness or something? Yeah, this is, sorry, I kind of was going through this pretty quickly, but um, this is what was reported to us, and I tried it myself, of course. Okay, sorry, and, I think I just... But we explicitly didn't give them names, or we didn't pin them to any concept while the people were doing the, the survey. We wanted to, it was kind of like this idea of like letting the network speak for itself, okay. especially also with this closed form factorization approach. Like the real motivation here is to not imbue the network with music technology concepts. It's letting it provide you with what it is um, uh, thinking as like the, the uh, give it the chance to describe the features itself. Yeah. 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 Thank you, everybody. Thank you.